It's said that nothing is forever, and this is especially true in the world of Idol. Members leave, music changes, and groups fall apart before our very eyes. These are some of the unfortunate truths about the industry that are commonly understood and begrudgingly accepted across the fandom. But that's not to say there aren't exceptions. Some groups become fixtures, constants that fans know they can rely on, be it due to success, consistency, or popularity. And that's where the topic of this series comes in. An anchor in the alternative idol scene for nearly a decade, this group endeared themselves to fans through their energetic performances, banging music, and an obvious passion for their work. All of these traits coupled with their true love for one another, helped them push on and persevere through their toughest challenges. For them, this unit wasn't just a musical act or idol group, it was a family. Everybody say hello to Gang Parade. Our story begins on a date returning viewers should be familiar with, and one I should have memorized by now. July 8th, 2014, the brand new Idol Society Disbandment Concert. It was at the end of this jam-packed Nippon Budokan show that now Bissalom, Kamiyasaki's next project, was revealed. She'd be teaming up with soloist Mizutamati to form, and I've read the comments, I appreciate the help, but get ready for this. Did I get it? I definitely struggle with the name, and it does kind of seem out of left field, but there's actually some interesting lore, I guess is the right word, behind it. Perenemy is actually a play on the word planimeter, which is a tool used to measure the area of a shape, though it's commonly used to measure points on a map. Where exactly does a measuring instrument fit into the duo's name, I hear you ask? Well, Saki lived in Tokyo and Mari in Osaka, two cities that are about 340 miles away from each other. So their name was derived from the fact that they lived far, far away from one another. Which was an interesting concept, but irony can be a cruel mistress. I'm sure Saki needs no introduction, but trust me. I don't mind. Even though her idol career began a few years beforehand, she really made a name for herself in 2013 with the iconic alternative idol unit BIS First Generation. The group's anti-idol persona and antics, along with their very, at the time, un-idol sound, earned them a die-hard fanbase, pioneered the alternative idol genre, and sent the members into the stratosphere. Now, who exactly is Mizutamati? Well, as previously mentioned, up until Peranime's announcement, she was a soloist who performed under the name Izuneko, which she got from a 1996 French film that apparently ain't too shabby. Anyways, debuting at the 2011 Tokyo Idol Festival, she performed as Izuneko until March 2nd, 2014 when her official website shut down, and her producer sent out an ominous tweet, hinting at Izuneko ceasing her solo activities. The next day, Izuneko herself completely denied that, but would ultimately come clean on May 24th, announcing the end of her solo career with one final live show. It's because of things like this that idol fans have trust issues. Izuneko's final performance went down on August 31st, 2014, and she released Sekai no Awadi no Izuneko 
or Izuneko's End of the World, a crowdfunded film serving as a farewell to the Persona on the same day. When Peranime was announced, Izuneko officially changed her stage name to Mizuta Madi. The project came together through Saki's desire to work with Madi, and the duo would waste little time getting started. Peranime made their official live debut on August 2nd at the 2014 Tokyo Idol Festival. Since their first show came so quickly, they were only able to perform their debut single, Plastic to Mercy, two times. But the audience was 100% into it, probably because it's a certified banger. This track set the stage for Peranime's electronic, high-energy sound, which was matched by their frenetic performance. Saki and Madi joined the audience midway through the song and hyped them up to the point where fans actually lifted Saki up as she continued the show. Of course, this isn't something that typically happens at idol concerts and was probably against the rules of the Tokyo Idol Festival, which are notoriously strict and prohibit crowd surfing. But I mean, come on. Saki came from a group who was known for their rowdy lives, so of course she'd bring that same energy to per anime shows. And that energy would continue to become more potent. Anyways, the audience got more than their fair share of per anime, as the duo returned on the second day of the festival to perform two sets. In the first set, they played Plastic 2 Mercy twice, and the single's b-side, Two Misery, as the finale. In the second set, they threw fans for a loop, opening with one performance of Plastic 2 Mercy, and closing with two performances of 2 Misery. A few days after their debut, Peranime signed with former BIS manager Jinosuke Watanabe's production company, WAC. They were actually among the first signees of the newly founded company, and were the first idol unit to sign on the dotted line. Though Watanabe was already their producer, so the duo signing was kind of a given. I also want to go on record as saying that Watanabe isn't really a bad guy at all. I know I made him out to be some kind of savage in my second generation BIS video, but that's just an act to drum up publicity for his company, and he only wants the best out of his talent. Just wanted to put that out there so no one maintains the wrong idea about the guy. They'd uploaded the video of their Tokyo Idol Festival performance to YouTube, which drummed up a lot of hype about the single and the duo, so they figured it'd be best to strike the iron while it's hot. On the single's release date, they tweeted that they'd be hosting a release event, an in-store shindig to commemorate a single or album's release, at Tower Records Shibuya. These events would become a staple of the group throughout the years, and are often filled with the members cosplaying, which was a big part of Perenime's theme, games, meet and greets, checky or Polaroid picture signings, mini lives, and more. Of course, fans who wanted to participate in the festivities had to purchase a physical copy of the single, but certain events, like the checky signing, required the purchase of numerous singles. As I've mentioned in the past, the ultimate goal of any idol group is to bring in the Dala Dala, and these kinds of small-scale events got fans to open their wallets, but they also helped build a genuine connection between Perenime and their audience. For this particular release event, those who purchased one copy of Plastic 2 Mercy were also given a ticket to a mini live show that would be held at Cut Up Studio, the venue beneath Tower Records' Shibuya location. Peranime performed in Kill a Kill cosplay, Saki as Ryoko Matoi, and Mari as Mako Mankashoku, and of course, they killed the performance. They performed Plastic 2 Mercy as the opening and closing track, and Saki repeated her Tokyo Idol Festival stunt, being lifted by the audience while continuing the performance. Following this reportedly successful event, they'd hold two more on October 1st and 2nd, at Tower Records Shinjuku and Kinshicho respectively. There, they debut some new songs like Letter, Who Am I, Neon, and more. Once the Plastic 2 Mercy release events were in the rear view, the duo would begin touring, constantly debuting new tracks and beginning to promote their next single, Unit, throughout November 
and December. Unit was slated for release on January 6th, 2015, but Christmas came early for fans because the single's video, which was also Pananame's first official music video, would be released on December 8th. In it, Saki and Madi are shackled together as they make a three-legged attempt up a mountain. They endure the type of strife that comes with every attempt at this stunt, not very many I'd imagine, ultimately reach the peak, and even though they free themselves, the experience brought them closer than the chains ever could, proving that friendship can overcome any hardship. I made that last part up. This video let everyone listen to UNIT, which was fairly well received, early, and they continued to hype up its release through lives at the end of 2014 and into 2015. On January 6th, 2015, two versions of UNIT were officially released, the regular edition and the limited edition, featuring lovely album art by Masuda Saiko. Of course, multiple release events were held following the single's release, and they even held their first one-man, called Say How Raw, at the fittingly named Daikinyami Unit on January 10th. What does Say How Raw even mean? I have questions. The One Man was Paranime's biggest show to date, likely thanks to Unit's positive reception and the wild, energetic image they'd established through their lives. And the duo's popularity would steadily rise from there. Throughout early 2015, they just didn't pump the brakes, maintaining a busy live schedule, making festival appearances, receiving television, blog, and magazine coverage, releasing their own merch, and even announcing regular shows in Saki and Madi's hometowns. And that was all just in the first three months of the year. Peranime exploded in popularity, which meant that an album would follow the blast, right? Well, like with any explosion, nothing good was left in its wake. On April 1st, 2015, Kamiyasaki, Mizutamadi, and Paraname's official website all informed fans that Madi would be graduating on May 31st. At first, no one believed what they were reading because it was April Fool's Day and you can't put it past Saki or Watanabe to pull a prank like this, but Madi herself took to Twitter to reaffirm that this news was, unfortunately, true. So why'd Madi want out? Well, according to the post on their website, artistic differences drove them apart. But I've also read that the distance between them and the difficulty of Madi's trek from Osaka to Tokyo started having a negative impact on her. Like I said, irony can be a cruel mistress. Both Madi and Saki took to their personal blogs to express their feelings about the situation. Madi said she loved everything about Padanime. The cosplay, the music, and her partner, but explained that she had other ambitions that she couldn't pursue as a part of the duo. Saki said she noticed the rift between them shortly after their Daikinyami Unit 1 man, and apologized for letting it grow and for being unable to support Madi. She also asked fans to continue supporting them through May 31st. Both blog entries were closed, with each of them saying they'd remain friends after Paranime's end. But here's the thing. Paranime wouldn't be ending. In the same post, it was announced that they'd be holding auditions for new members in April. Eligible auditionees were females or males aged 17 to 28, and it looks like I may have just missed the application phase. The news wasn't easy for fans to take, but most of them said they'd continue to support the members and put anime even after Madi's graduation. So, the duo pressed onwards, albeit at a far less rigorous pace than in the beginning of the year performing lives with the same high energy that made them stand out. And they brought that same energy to Madi's final show, with the fans responding in kind, jumping, chanting, 
and crowd surfing the entire time. They played pretty much every one of their songs, but their debut single, Plastic 2 Mercy, got four performances across the 18-song setlist, even closing out the show. The final performance of the song is the most noteworthy, as the crowd at Takamatsu Monster went all out for it. They started tossing balloons around, gave Madi a crown, and let her crowd surf in an inflatable raft. Peranime went out the same way they entered the scene, a frenetic force of electronic energy. Only this time, the energy finally died down. Once Saki and Madi thanked the audience, presented themselves as a pair one last time, and took their final bow, Mizuta Madi officially graduated from Peranime. Of course, this wasn't the end of their story. Shortly after the show, four new members were announced, and the group was officially renamed. Thank goodness. The chapter of Peranime was one about quickly rising to small success through constant work, passion, dedication, and establishing a connection with fans. Even though that chapter came to an end fairly quickly, Saki and the new members were about to begin writing one that would change the group's image, continue its growth, and garner more notoriety. Thus, we enter a new period of Plastic to Mercy. As of May 31st, 2015, Perenime was no more. The group was officially renamed P.O.P., or Period of Plastic 2 Mercy, which was a name apparently suggested by Bish member Aina the End. The names of the four new members were also revealed, and joining Saki in P.O.P. was Yamamachi Miki, Yume no Yua, Shigusawa Ao, and Inukai Maya. But the announcements didn't end there. P.O.P. also revealed that they'd be releasing an album on August 4th, and holding a one-man to celebrate the release on August 9th. Fans got their first look at the new members via Saki and now P.O.P.'s Twitter accounts, though they all had their faces obscured. This is a common practice for WAC groups, as Bish and Empire both did the same thing, but their faces were revealed once they'd each accumulated a certain amount of Twitter followers. Things were handled differently with P.O.P. though. From June 1st to the 4th, their official Twitter account posted images at midnight each night, with each one slowly revealing more and more of their faces. By June 4th, fans got their first look at P.O.P.'s lineup, with some quickly roasting their white eyes. Yamamachi Miki was a huge Perenime and Kamiyasaki fan, attending a number of their shows and auditioning for the group solely to meet her favorite member. She'd ultimately passed the audition, probably due to her distinctive singing style, which she developed through her high school's music club and weekly karaoke sessions with friends. Despite the glamorous world of idol and fame, Miki prefers being alone to read manga, watch anime, or play video games. Her goal with P.O.P. was to constantly aim higher, to help the group expand musically, and to grow. Yume no Yua shares a somewhat similar background with Yamamachi Miki, performing in a band during her days as a student. Her interest in idols was sparked when she saw Denbegumi Inc. appear in a fashion show, and despite not being a teenager anymore, she eventually decided to audition for a group. Yua suffers from depression, and has always been very open about her mental health, but wanted to change her mindset to be more positive so it at least doesn't interfere in her day-to-day -day life. Outside of Idol, her primary hobby is cooking, because she loves to eat. Yume no Yua's goal with P.O.P. was to make all five members stand out or interesting in some way. 
The youngest member of the group, Shigusawa Ao wasn't particularly interested in anything of note growing up. While the other kids had their favorite anime or manga characters, Ao could never relate to that because she's never really been interested in anything for an extended period of time. The only thing that she consistently enjoyed as a kid, and even upon joining P.O.P., was art. Specifically, drawing and painting. Despite this, her goals with P.O.P. were bold. To energize the audience and help them forget what they don't like during their live shows. Inukai Maya participated in ballet very briefly as a child, but she admits that her dancing isn't the best. As a matter of fact, her favorite activities are reading and writing. Not exactly the most physically demanding hobbies. Still, her never give up attitude makes her want to push herself to improve in any way possible. Personally, her goal was to improve as a dancer. But when it came to P.O.P., she wanted to make the group stand out. To do something no one else was doing. And it wouldn't be very long before Maya's goal was fulfilled. While the face reveals should have been big news, P.O.P. made headlines for another reason. On the morning of June 4th, Bish challenged them to a 200km Ekiden, or long distance relay, to be held on June 6th. How could they run? They couldn't even see yet. I know we've talked about marathons quite a bit in, in past videos, but aside from being guaranteed headline grabbers, there's a chance this was done as Watanabe's response to AKB48's annual Senbatsu election, which was being held the same day, though that may just be speculation. Anyways, a post on Bish's website laid out the details of this challenge. The groups would start from Shibuya and run 100 kilometers to Atami, where they'd stay the night, then make the trek back to Shibuya the next morning. Of course, the whole thing would be live streamed because nothing like this in WAC counts if it isn't, and two cash prizes were up for grabs. The victorious group would receive 100,000 yen, and a fan voted MVP would receive 50,000 yen out of Watanabe's own pocket. See, not so bad. But there was one issue. The teams would be uneven, since P.O.P. had five members and Bish only had four. Luckily, their valiant leader, Jinosuke Watanabe, stepped up and decided to take the fifth spot on Team Bish. Again, credit goes where credit's due. When the marathon was announced, fans wished both groups luck showing their support on Twitter in the days leading up to the Ekiden, and in person on the day of. Everyone even received some encouragement from the legendary Poor Dewey, who also used the opportunity to plug her band's upcoming one-man. Nice. The marathon began around 6am, with Saki representing P.O.P. and Watanabe representing Bish. And according to those watching, Watanabe didn't fare so well against Saki. Thankfully, fans who couldn't be there or watch the Nico Nico broadcast were kept updated via Twitter by those watching, in attendance, or even running alongside both groups. Surprisingly enough, poor Dewey even made time in her busy schedule to actually show up on the first night in support of her. No, no, wait, I'm sorry, that's just a fan cosplaying as poor Dewey with the toilet seat. I'm sure she'd approve. Every member wound up running about 20 kilometers to Atami and back, with Saki bringing home the victory for Team P.O.P., crossing the finish line around 9pm on the 7th. Senchihiro Chidi arrived at the goal about 20 minutes after Saki, unfortunately bringing home the L for Team Bish. Because P.O.P. won the race, they were awarded the 100,000 yen cash prize, and presented with... Radishes. Which, based on my research, offer very little nutritional value for runners. The day after the marathon, the members of both Bish and P.O.P. had their names tweeted out, with whomever received the most retweets being named MVP, and winning the 50,000 yen of Watanabe's money. It was a close call. 
for the Bish team. But Momoko Gumi Company wound up winning the 50,000 yen. P.O.P. walked away with some cash, but this marathon served a far greater purpose than bringing home some Dala Dala. There was a buzz about it online before it even happened, but in the home stretch, there were over 230,000 viewers on Nico Nico. It likely brought new eyes to both groups, and P.O.P. capitalized on the opportunity, plugging their August 9th one man with the signs around their necks. All in all, the Ekiden was just one big publicity stunt turned advertisement. And it worked. Throughout July, they continued performing lives, played a couple of festivals, revealed their debut album's artwork, which is incredible, and advertised their August 9th one man as much as possible. By July 24th, a majority of the album's tracks were uploaded to SoundCloud, allowing fans to listen to 9 of its 10 song track list early and for free. The only song missing from the catalog was pretty, pretty good, but they'd upload it to Ototoy the same day. As 54 tracks of Paradata. Fans were then challenged to mix the tracks together to find the song, and someone was successful uploading the result to their own SoundCloud page. Outside of all that, P.O.P. was also announced for the 2015 Tokyo Idol Festival, where they'd be performing on both August 1st and 2nd. At least, that was the plan. Before we get there though, they revealed that their debut one man had sold out on July 30th, so they must have been pumped up heading into the world's biggest idol festival. Maybe a little too pumped. So, August 1st rolls around, and the festivities of the Tokyo Idol Festival are in full swing. The performances seem to be going well. The crowd appears to be having a good time. And everything is going according to the festival's notoriously strict rules. Then, at 7pm, P.O.P. takes the festival stage for their 15-minute set and all hell breaks loose. According to one blog post on the situation, their fans just got really out of control. As they performed, the audience was moshing, crowd surfing, throwing objects, removing their shirts, participating in other activities that could result in injury, and POP members were stage diving, which are all commonplace for their own lives, but prohibited at the Tokyo Idol Festival. The audience's behavior and the group's encouragement of it resulted in them being expelled from the 2015 festival, meaning they wouldn't return for their August 2nd performance. I also want to mention the fact that Bish 2 was expelled, though apparently they did something to pay homage to OG Bish, and the audience went berserk, practically destroying the stage, and forcing police to get involved to stop their set. No footage of these incidents seems to exist anywhere online, though there is video of P.O.P. performing after everything happened, and they appear to be pretty gassed. Upon learning they'd been booted off the card, the members took to Twitter to thank fans for coming, express their joy of being at the festival, and to apologize for breaking the rules. But things get interesting when you consider the fact that other groups, like Passcode, also had audiences who violated the rules, yet faced no punishment. Conspiracy time? Not really. There's speculation that P.O.P. may have performed at the Tokyo Idol Festival solely to do what they did. While purposefully getting kicked out of the world's biggest idol festival may seem like a foolish move, it's something that would definitely spark conversation. Bish and P.O.P. were among the biggest talking points from the festival, which is impressive considering the vast lineup they were a part of. This could only benefit P.O.P., whose album was set to drop... Huh. What do you know? Three days later. It's starting to seem like some thought may have been put into this, huh? 
There's also some thinking that the decision to boot both groups off of the card could have been influenced by the fact that Watanabe was involved with both acts. It's pretty safe to say that Passcode and other groups didn't go out there and intend to rile fans up to the point of rule breaking. But the same can't be said for P.O.P. Though there's no evidence of this, the idea of Watanabe putting a plan like this in motion sounds plausible. After all, this is the guy who put the same groups against an AKB48 election. The same guy behind Bis League and Diet or Die. So, does being purposefully removed from the Tokyo Idol Festival sound so far-fetched? The stunt definitely worked in P.O.P.'s favor, as people were talking about their expulsion from the show, with some expressing how cool it made the group look, others wanting to learn more about them, and even some wanting tickets to their sold-out one-man. And they'd ride that momentum to August 4th the release date of their self-titled debut album. Of course, the group held release events the entire week, from August 3rd to the 8th, where they'd hold handshake events, take photos with fans, sign checkies, and perform mini-lives. Also on August 4th, the music video for Pretty Pretty Good was released. The video, which takes place in a scrapyard, sees P.O.P. slowly being lifted by a crane, which they're attached to by makeshift harnesses. Makes my palms sweat just thinking about it. Pretty Pretty Good was the only original P.O.P. song on the album, with the other nine tracks being remakes of Peranime songs, most of which never received official releases, only being played live by the duo. Despite that, fans came out in droves to see P.O.P., at one of their numerous release events, proving that their stunts had paid off. The group would ride that wave of momentum from there to their Daikinyama One Man on August 9th. Though no footage of the show seems to exist online, fans were thanking P.O.P. for giving their all. And knowing the group's energy, I'd imagine they killed it. Their performance even earned the praise of Saki's old friend, Mizutamati who showed up in support of the group, which you'll love to see. At the end of the show, they thanked everyone for coming, asked them to continue supporting the group, and announced Kamiyasaki's suspension. The reason given was some variation of violating various prohibitions, likely referring to the group's expulsion from the Tokyo Idol Festival a few days prior. The blame had to fall on someone, and seeing how Saki was P.O.P.'s leader, and probably the primary source of the rowdy behavior's encouragement, of course she'd shoulder it. Her suspension would be indefinite, and she took to Twitter and her blog the next day to assure fans that she'd be returning to P.O.P., and encouraged them to continue supporting the other four members in her absence. Though her suspension led to a lot of confusion and shock, it wasn't without reason. Announcing it at their debut one man was a surefire way to spark even more conversation about the group online. The late timing of it could have something to do with avoiding outrage because of Saki's absence at such a significant show, but that's just speculation on my part. Anyways, after their Daikinyama unit show and the bombshell announcement, P.O.P. proceeded as normal, announcing their appearance at that year's Idolage Carnival the next day. For the next few months, they'd mostly play festivals like Jam Expo 2015, Banmon Fest, and the Gyu Agricultural Festival, which they appeared to headline thanks to Saki's suspension and the fascination surrounding the group afterwards. In the lead-up to the festival, they actually had a drama miniseries produced to basically set up this entire idol warfare thing, I think. Regardless, it's super campy and filled with some real goofs if you're interested in checking it out. I also want to mention the fact that they performed in a wrestling ring at the Gyu Agricultural Festival. It's not really significant or noteworthy in any way, I just love it when pro wrestling and idol 
two of my favorite things collide. Imagine my joy when I discovered Maki Ito. With each show, the crowds got bigger and bigger, and P.O.P. maintained the wild energy that got them booted out of the Tokyo Idol Festival. It really seemed like fans got used to the four-member lineup. But that didn't mean they accepted it. Throughout August and September, they'd constantly tweet at Saki, eagerly awaiting her return to the stage. It wasn't just the fans missing her, though. Of course, her fellow groupmates were also longing for her return. So much so, that Inukai Maya would go on to mention that she actually wanted to quit following Saki's suspension. We'd get an update on her status on September 11th, and while something's better than nothing, this definitely wasn't what fans wanted. In a Tumblr post regarding the making of the aforementioned drama miniseries, it was revealed that Saki was acting as a member of P.O.P. staff while suspended. Examples of her duties were monitoring the speaker's audio and giving them choreography tips at their live shows. But the same post also stated that it was unclear when she'd return to the stage. October would bring more of the same as well. P.O.P. performed at a few festivals and held some lives, but no update on Saki's suspension was given. Until the end of the month. On October 29th, it was announced that the group would be holding their second one man, called Comeback Mai, at Shimo Kitazawa Shelter on December 5th, and Saki would be able to join her group on stage. But of course, there was a catch. In order to rejoin P.O.P., she'd have to complete a 100km marathon within 24 hours. That wasn't all though, because it was also stated that if Saki failed to reach the goal within 24 hours, she would leave P.O.P. The added stakes were sure to pique interest in the marathon and the group, but it's not like this was Saki's first rodeo. In 2013, she ran 100 kilometers with Biss, and was the only member who completed the marathon, so the odds were somewhat in her favor. And even if they weren't, Saki's a lot like Batman. She can do anything, if you give her enough time. And she had over a month to prepare. In the same post, it was announced that the marathon would be live-streamed, was there ever any doubt. Its start time would be 11.30 on December 4th, and tickets for Comeback Mai would go on sale on November 14th. The starting point would be Fuji-Q Highland, with Shimo Kitazawa Shelter being the goal. Fuji-Q Highland was also the starting point for Porurui and Yuriko Wakisaka's 2012 marathon that ultimately led to Wakisaka's exit from BIS, which was a nice callback and little piece of trivia. The post mostly focused on Saki's marathon and P.O.P.'s second one-man, but it also announced the group's first single. Technically third, but let's not get into that. Happy Lucky, Kira Kira Lucky. Set to be released on December 8th. However, fans would get to hear the single a bit earlier than that, as the song's music video dropped on November 24th. And it included... A pleasant surprise, Kamiya Saki. Even though she was still suspended, she made it onto the single and into the video, which was kind of a standard J-pop video, complete with bubbles, balloons, and confetti. There were also some charming P.O.P. member hand puppets and weapons, which would make for an interesting children's program. Save for Pretty Pretty Good, this single was P.O.P.'s first official track, and the sound reflected the change the group underwent. While it did retain a lot of Perenime's electronic influences, it relies more on instruments, with the electro serving as a supporting rhythm, only really shining in its solo. The result was something that sounded closer to regular J-pop, but just a twinge heavier. The single's artwork was also revealed to be a live-action recreation of their first album's art, just in their new outfits. Easter eggs aplenty. 
Anyways, the same day as Happy Lucky Kira Kira Lucky's music video release, it was announced that tickets for their second one man had sold out. Once again, Watanabe's antics landed the mark. Though I don't want to discredit the group, who continue playing lives and festivals throughout November, probably promoting the heck out of this show and their upcoming release. That brings us to the fateful day of December 4th, 2015. Redemption Day for Saki. The marathon began at its allotted time, and fans were cheering her on online and in person, with some even running alongside her. Of course, the journey wasn't easy, as she fought decreasing temperatures and fatigue. However, she received support in the form of fan art, including sketches from the Kill La Kill character designer, and tweets from fellow Bissalum, First Summer Wika, and Tentenko, along with her friend, Mizu Tamati, who were all tuned in, anticipating the result. As the clock continued counting down, people became more anxious, mostly because it seemed like Saki was finally starting to slow down. By the morning of December 5th, viewers and her POP mates were on the edge of their seats, because even though she was closing in on the goal, the result was still very much up in the air. There was a good chance Saki could just collapse and then that'd be it. So they continued sending her positive vibes, cautioning her to be careful, and encouraging her to reach the goal. And she did. On the morning of December 5th, around 8am, Kamiyasaki reached Shimokitazawa shelter with two hours to spare. The fans who were waiting for her at the goal cheered. Twitter blew up with relief and praise. And the rest of POP met her, tears in their eyes, as she gave a short speech, thanking everyone for their support. Oh, and it seems like she took a bit of a rest, and honestly, no judgment for sleeping on the ground. It was a difficult few months for fans and for P.O.P., but it was all finally coming to an end later that night. At the beginning of their comeback my one man, Saki was officially welcomed back into P.O.P. I know that's all well and good, but I just want to let everyone know that P.O.P.'s manager, Ogawa, ran the entire marathon alongside her, wearing a suit. A close runner-up for MVP, honestly. So, after their second one-man and Saki's welcoming back, the group held multiple release events for Happy Lucky Kira Kira Lucky from December 8th to the 13th. And it seemed like everyone was elated that P.O.P. was a five-person unit again, showing us all that we should never take a good thing for granted. They'd round out 2015 with a few more lives, and then started looking ahead to the new year. Early 2016 was business as usual for the always busy group. Their first live would be held on January 4th. Then, later on in the month, they'd announce another one-man for March 14th. In February, they'd appear at a few more festivals, and make an appearance on Extreme Lunch Break, which describes itself as a variety show that promotes beauty and health violently. Based on what I've seen of it, seems like it was a pretty good time for everyone. However, February was significant for P.O.P., in that they'd embark on their first official tour, the Anarchy Tour. Performing five dates from February to April, the group would also unveil their newest single, Queen of Pop, at the tour's first show on February 20th. The single was set to be released on March 15th, the day after their third one man, also called Queen of Pop. But to hype it up even more, they released the song's music video on March 7th. To describe it in one word, the video's... Odd. It sees the group wearing black morph suits as they attempt to recreate various symbols, like the Ankh, Infinity, and Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, along with a few more that I could not track down for the life of me. 
These are intercut with shots of them in their new outfits. And it all comes to a head with this image that emits an almost cult-like vibe, encouraging fans to open new credit cards and splurge on their favorite idol group, P.O.P. Not certain what it means, and most viewers really weren't too sure what they were watching either. But like I said, it's odd. The day after the show, Queen of Pop was officially released, and P.O.P. celebrated it the only way they knew how, with five days of release events, beginning on March 17th and ending on the 21st. But this go-around, they didn't really get to bask in the release of another successful single. On March 19th, they held an additional one-man at Shimokitazawa Shelter, called Queen of Shelter, and it was there that their manager, you know, Marathon in a Suit Guy, announced the group's third single, We Are the Idol. Slated for a July 19th release, they'd also hold another one man, which shared a name with the single, on the 18th. And at this point, I think you can argue that P.O.P. was a fairly big name. They'd released two singles to overwhelmingly positive fanfare, were selling out shows like crazy, received a ton of coverage from various music outlets, and showed no signs of slowing down with yet more new music on the horizon, and a busy few months ahead of them, even being welcomed back to the Tokyo Idol Festival after... the rowdiness. Simply put, it seemed like P.O.P.'s momentum could not be halted by anything. Well, maybe not anything. It's gonna sound weird, but at this stage, P.O.P.'s biggest enemy was internet search engines. Even though it's pronounced using Japanese syllables, it's stylized with the English letters P and O, meaning it's typed out as the word pop, and entering that into Twitter or Google will get you millions of results. Just not very many, if any, of the idol group. Admittedly, it's impressive that they performed for as long as they did using that name, because it's not like this issue was new. As a matter of fact, P.O.P.'s manager and Saki herself both struggled to find relevant results about the group on the same day they changed their name in 2015. They only really got by because Aina the End suggested using Katakana, the writing system used mostly for foreign words in Japanese, when searching for the group's name. But at the end of the day, their name was still stylized in English, and that's what most new fans were gonna look up. Tenured fans, on the other hand, would know which characters to use, so it probably didn't phase them when Watanabe sent out a cryptic tweet on March 12th saying, I think it's time to change the name. Any artist changing their name is a big deal, so it's important that time is given for everyone involved to discuss and think things over, and that's exactly what the members of P.O.P. did, officially announcing their name change on June 17th. When discussing what their new name should be, all five members knew they wanted it to be cool and unique. Something that would really catch people's eyes. Unfortunately, while we only know the end result, multiple names were apparently thrown around. But, two words continually popped up. And it was these two words that helped propel the group to new heights they'd expand their ranks, diversify their musical palette, find their identity as a group, and would take Kamiyasaki's initial idea to unimaginable heights. Of course, that didn't mean they'd have an easy path. Quite the opposite at times, some of their lows being unimaginably low. But this name change set them down the path to stardom. The end of P.O.P. was the beginning of a story that many hold near and dear. One that many can't imagine the alternative idol scene, or their lives, without. The end of P.O.P. was the beginning of Gang Parade.
On June 17th, their renaming was made official. In a post on their website, P.O.P. rebranded themselves as Gang Parade, stylized with all capital letters. In that same post, they also revealed the cover for their next single, We Are the Idol, the group's new outfits, and posted the details on their We Are the Idol One Man at Shibuya WWW. The renaming left some fans confused, but the overall reaction was a positive one, mostly due to the aforementioned search result issue that many encountered. Plus, I doubt support for these five would wane regardless of what they were named. And there seems to be some merit to that, as the newly dubbed group held their first live as Gang Parade on June 21st. The first didn't stop at the end of June, because on July 7th, they released the music video for We Are The Idol, and this sobering video was a far cry from their energetic, strange releases as P.O.P. The song is a ballad about the group wanting to achieve their dreams as idols, but having to endure the fear of failing. The mostly muted color palette, doubt-filled lyrics, and symbolism of being trapped are all washed away at the video's end as everyone abandons their black dresses and white shirts to dance in their bright We Are The Idol outfits. Following the video's release, they set their sights towards their July 18th One Man at Shibuya WWW. This show could potentially be a milestone for the group, as the venue's 450 person capacity made it the biggest one they'd performed at yet. And they were determined to reach the limit, making radio show appearances, doing magazine interviews, and constantly tweeting about the show. All of their constant promotion and work paid off too, because Gang Parade successfully filled the venue to capacity, officially making We Are The Idol their largest show to date. Before performing for a record crowd, they'd be back on the road on July 17th, opening for Bish and the Legendary 6ix9ine in Sendai. Right after the show, they set off on an overnight 230 mile trek from Sendai to Shibuya, only to reach the venue the next day with a few hours to spare for their sold out We Are the Idol one man. The previous day's performance and ensuing five-hour journey toll, toll free, we know Watanabe's not paying tolls, was not enough to deter Gang Parade from putting on a show that the 450 fans in attendance would never forget. They played an 18-song set list, including three encores with songs from their previous incarnations, and closed the show with their first performance of the eponymously named single. However, the surprises didn't stop with their final encore. They provided some fans with a night I'm sure they'll never forget, performing the first encore in swimsuits. Apparently, Shibuya WWW is a venue famous for idols performing in swimsuits, with Biss originally doing it in 2013 and Bish following suit <laughs> in 2015. Secondly, July 18th, 2016 was Marine Day in Japan, which falls on the third Monday of every July and is a day to celebrate the ocean's bounty, which many Japanese do by going to the beach. Lastly, the song they performed, Kore wa Kito Aventure, was written as a summer party song, and the swimsuits helped set the summer mood for most, and probably another mood for others. I don't even think Sonic has this much lore. You must be kidding! After the second encore, the group announced that their next album, Barely Last, would come out on November 8th, and that they'd be holding a one-man five days after the release at Shinjuku Blaze, which had a capacity of 800 people, so Gang Parade was further upping the ante. Honestly, I don't doubt they could have sold out a bigger venue with how much they were working. Leading up to the 18th, I don't know how they got through their insane schedule. Whether it was the fans, the adrenaline, 
their dreams, or something else. But Gang Parade was always on the move, like a bullet train with no station in sight. But someone's gotta get off eventually. After their record-setting one man, they hosted release events for We Are The Idol, beginning on the 19th. And while the first one went down as normal, the July 20th festivities would be dampened by an unfortunate announcement. During their performance at Tower Records Shibuya's cut-up studio, Shigusawa Ao announced that she'd be withdrawing from Gang Parade. With her final performance being the last day of the Tokyo Idol Festival, August 7th. The announcement caught many fans off guard, mostly because they felt like Al had grown the most in her time with the group, having stepped up considerably during Saki's suspension the previous year. It was something nobody saw coming. Though she didn't provide a reason why at the show, she'd open up about the decision in an Ototoi interview posted after the event. To summarize, Ao said her parents didn't support her decision to be an idol, and that she no longer wanted to go against their wishes. She went on to say that she didn't want to leave Gang Parade or quit being an idol, but that she simply couldn't betray her parents. Initially, her groupmates didn't believe her, saying that she herself wasn't even convinced that this was what she wanted to do. Thankfully, after some convincing from Ao, they eventually came around fully supporting her decision, and this interview showed fans her perspective, winning many of them over too. In that same interview, Ao stated that Gang Parade helped her grow as a person, that it gave her purpose. She said that she always wanted to move forward with the group, even in times of self-doubt or feeling like she'd failed. She closed it by saying that she'd never forget all the things she learned as a member, and that she'd be putting her all into every live and event until August 7th. And they continue adhering to their busy schedule, holding release events and live shows throughout the end of July and into early August, all the way to the beginning of the 2016 Tokyo Idol Festival. The three-day extravaganza began on August 5th, with Gang Parade playing 15-minute sets on the Smile Garden stage on night one, the Doll Factory stage on night two, and the Sky Stage on the final night. They'd perform three songs on the Sky Stage, We Are the Idol, Letter, and Happy Lucky Kira Kira Lucky. Though the set was short, Gang Parade reportedly let their emotions flow as the sun set over the stage, creating this beautiful, almost poetic atmosphere. Of course, amongst the emotions flowing were tears from both fans and the members themselves. Before the last song, Saki told the audience that she wanted to make Ao regret leaving the group by showing her the happiest sight. Then, everyone put their all into one last performance as a quintet. But once the final song was over, and everyone left the stage in tears, their final show as a five-person unit had ended. Ao turned to the crowd as she left the stage, giving them one final smile. And with that, Shigusawa Ao officially graduated from Gang Parade. Ao was a crucial part of the group, who endeared herself to fans and her groupmates through her determination, work ethic, and passion for being an idol. So everybody was still processing or grief-stricken by her graduation except for the group's management. On August 8th, the very next day, it was announced that they'd be holding auditions for new members. Wipe away those tears, there's work to do. The application deadline was midnight on August 18th, and those selected to join the gang I really hate myself for that joke. would debut on October 2nd at a one-man show in Nagoya. They also announced a second one-man for October 16th in Osaka, and continue promoting their Shinjuku Blaze One Man on November 13th. Thankfully, Gang Parade got time to grieve the departure of their friend. Just not a whole lot. They'd be back to performing on August 11th, their first show without Ao, 
and fans were still supporting the group, hoping to see them continue growing both musically and in popularity, in spite of being a member short. From that point, everyone began looking towards October 2nd, eagerly anticipating the new additions to the group, and Gang Parade themselves kept the future in their sights, continuing promotion for their biggest show to date, and barely last release. However, the momentum they were building would be interrupted by something... unforeseen. On September 15th, it was announced that Inukai Maya would be taking an indefinite hiatus from the group. No details about this hiatus were provided by Gang Parade's website, and Maya herself wasn't active on Twitter following this. But Saki confirmed that they would continue as a three-person unit until further notice. It was indeed business as usual for the trio, as they'd perform various shows throughout September, with Saki, Yua, and Miki bringing the same high energy they were famous for to every single one. But while fans enjoyed the performances, some began to voice concern about Maya's hiatus, especially since no update was provided by the end of the month. Though, WAC wouldn't keep them waiting very long after that. On October 1st, it was announced that Maya would be withdrawing from the group immediately. The startling news was posted on Gang Parade's website and included a link to Maya's blog, where she elaborated on the last few weeks. In her blog post, she said that her father's health had been declining, and that he'd collapsed a bit before her hiatus. She took time off to be with them, and while away from the lights and music, she reflected on all her parents had done for her, how they supported her, and how happy she was for that. But now, she thought it was time to give back to them, and her worry for her parents trumped her love for Idol, resulting in Inukai Maya's withdrawal from Gang Parade. She closed out the post by stating that she hoped Gang Parade would continue to rise through the ranks of the Idol world, and thanked the group's staff, members, management, and of course, the fans, for loving and supporting her. As a final request, she asked that everyone remember her as an idol. She wasn't asking for people to not move on. She simply wanted a place in the corner of everyone's hearts. And I can say that she's definitely earned a place in mine. Two losses within three months must have taken a toll on the remaining Gang Parade members, but they'd have no time to dwell on Maya's departure as their Nagoya one-man and new member's debut was imminent. They'd kick off the show pretty normally, opening with Plastic 2 Mercy. But the opening line was sung by someone not on stage. That someone then ran out in front of the audience, who reportedly erupted in applause, and introduced themselves as the newest member of Gang Parade, Can Micah. A new member wasn't the only change the group would make at that performance. They'd begin reshaping their image, and implemented three new declarations, as they were called. 1. Their fans would now be known as Playboys. It'll make sense in a minute. 2. Fans could now take photos and videos of live performances. People did that way before the show, but that's fine. And 3. Dangerous acts, like lifting and moshing during live performances, were now prohibited. They actually tried implementing the third declaration as P.O.P. following their 2015 Tokyo Idol Festival suspension, though I'm convinced it was more of a nudge-nudge, wink-wink situation then. It probably was at this show too. They then officially kicked off the show, introducing themselves as Mina no Asobiba, or Everyone's Playground. Hence the Playboy's name. Gang Parade would perform 19 songs with their usual energy, and Can Micah kept up with them, impressing the fans, along with her new groupmates, who welcomed her into the group following the show. For Can Micah, 
her debut probably felt like a doubtful dream had come true. Her father was a huge Bish fan and encouraged her to apply for Bish in 2015 and the Bish Reformation the next year, but she never made it past the application phase. Wack almost lost somebody talented with her too, because she'd been dancing since she was in elementary school. Even being selected as one of 10 members for a middle school national dance competition, only being held back from participating due to her poor grades. She even gave fans a glimpse of her skills at her debut, standing on one leg with the other up in the air. She entered Gang Parade with the goal of making the group better than it was before her, and was working vigorously to learn their music and catch up on their already convoluted history. And not to spoil anything for you, but this debut would mark the end of Gang Parade struggling to keep members. Can Micah's debut also just so happened to go down on the first date of the group's barely last tour, which would see them perform a number of small lives throughout October and November to promote the album's release. The tour would officially end with their barely last one man on November 13th, but the spotlight wouldn't stay on Can Micah for very long. On October 5th, it was announced that the members of the now defunct sister group of Bis, Sis, would be joining Gang Parade under new stage names, all of which were revealed in a video where Watanabe wears a strange hat. Used to have a hat like that. Would have been a good bit. Anyways, the newest members of Gang Parade were Chin Mide, who was renamed Yuiga Doksun, Sono Shion, who became Tarashima Yuka, and Coco Chanel, who became Coco Patin Coco. And these three endured an unbelievable amount of heartbreak and disappointment to get where they wound up. Yuiga Doksun originally auditioned for Bish and made it all the way to the end of the audition, before being cut in the final interview. From that point on, she knew she wanted to be an idol, as the concept and culture of it greatly interested her. In 2016, she joined an idol group called Exit, where she was known as Otonashi Naru. Exit was formed and captained by pro wrestler Haruka Kato further intertwining the worlds of idol and pro wrestling. Speaking of intertwined worlds, one of Doxon's former groupmates was none other than Shiraku Yuki. Small world, isn't it? Anyways, Otonashi withdrew from the group due to varying circumstances in August of 2016. Though she was seen at the BIS audition a bit later, so who knows what those circumstances really were. Before joining SIS, Tarashima Yuka felt directionless, a high schooler only considering a pharmaceutical career due to its stability and pay. Feeling like she needed a change, she auditioned for Bish in 2015, and her failure in that audition motivated her to try out for Bis the next year. Disappointed at her omission from Bis, she joined SIS with the goal of outdoing their sister group. Petty jealousy, I love it. When Sis disbanded, she felt like her world was shattered, and that she'd never find her purpose in life. Until the three former members made their goals and enthusiasm clear to Watanabe, who let them join Gang Parade. A first generation Bis fan, well after Tentenko, Saki, and First Summer Wika joined, Coco Pots and Coco applied to audition for Bish though she wasn't selected to audition for the group at all, only getting her break when she applied to join BIS in 2016. Coming from a well-off family, her parents put her through private school and sent her to college. But for Coco, becoming an idol was her only way out of school, and she loved everything about the industry. The costumes, stage names, music, and presents. That, combined with not wanting to work an office job, are what pushed her to continue pursuing her dreams of stardom. It's also worth mentioning that her name is a dick joke, albeit one you have to squint to see. A Japanese slang term for penis is chinko, 
and the extra cocoa was added to the end to make it resemble that term. Though it's quite a reach. You'd have to pronounce it as coco patinko ko, which just sounds unnatural. Still, I love the extra effort put in by a grown man for a joke that convoluted and obscure. In the same video announcing their addition, it was revealed that they'd be making their debut at the group's barely last one man, and they even started promoting the show on Twitter the next day, with Gang Parade even doing the same, and performing lives to hype up this monumental event. Aside from live shows, October would see them release a few songs from Barely Last for free on SoundCloud, and begin making plans for the album's release events, set to begin on November 7th. Barely Last officially dropped on November 8th, and they'd continue promoting its release through events, including another one where they wore gigantic Nico Nico mascots on their heads. Barely Last marked a new direction for Gang Parade sound. This album would have plenty of electronic rhythms for everyone to jam out to, like Sugar, Crazy Night, and Tewo no Basu, but certain tracks like Don't Forget Me Not, Isin Itai, and This Is Love Song would have a more driving, rock influence sound. A lot of diversity on the album, and definitely a lot of tracks that would rile up live audiences. And the group would get to put their new music to the test on November 13th, at their barely last one man. From the get-go, the crowd was hot, as Gang Parade performed songs from the album and others spanning their entire history. And it's hard to believe that Coco, Tarashima, and Dachshun were debuting that evening, because the three of them gelled with the other four members so well, it's like they'd always been together. This is especially impressive, considering the three of them only had a little over a month to memorize all the lyrics and choreography, with the former two lacking any extensive performing experience. To put it simply, Gang Parade had their fans in the palms of their hands thanks to their infectious energy, upbeat music, and the unbelievable way everyone just seemed to gel. There was really something there that night. Something that I think was always there, but just happened to finally be tapped into. Gang Parade were always renowned for their incredible live performances, but they really felt like stars throughout this show. They just needed more of a push into the spotlight. Something that Watanabe is a master at doing. And he'd prove that once again, towards the end of the show. He came out on stage, literally throwing Saki out of the way and pushing everyone else aside, making the show about him for a bit. And fair play, he deserves it. His first announcement was at the group's first single, with seven members, a re-recording of Plastic 2 Mercy, would be released on December 27th, and everyone, especially the newest members, were excited about it. But their excitement would quickly turn to despair with his second announcement. He then revealed that the group would be running a 200km Ekiden on December 3rd through the 4th, but this one would be different from the past few marathons. This time, it would be Saki taking on the other six members in a round trip from Dogenzaka to Atami, with Saki running the entire thing, and the other members tagging each other in and out after a certain distance. Oh, and it was to be live-streamed, naturally. The news shocked the experienced members, who seemed to eventually look forward to it, but the new members looked terrified, and understandably so. 200 kilometers is an overwhelming distance, and per Google Maps, the distance from Dogenzaka to Atami is about 23 hours on foot, meaning everyone, especially Saki, was about to put in some serious mileage. But this challenge wasn't enough to scare the former CIS members away. So they ended the show by reaffirming Plastic 2 Mercy's release date and performing that very song with Watanabe just vibing in the background, the rascal, and close the show on a high note, washing away the fear of what they'd just been told. Of course, the crowd was into it, though there was no crowd surfing or lifting, so it seems like Gang Parade's declarations were being upheld. 
we'll see how long that lasts. Fans seem to respond positively to the seven-person lineup and the hard work the three new members put in, including Sleepless Nights of Practice, definitely showed. As mentioned earlier, the four new members brought a new energy to the group, with the Playboy seeming revitalized, barely last gaining more steam following its release, and interest in Gang Parade being at an all-time high. Something the group would capitalize on. They'd close out November by performing a few small lives, and attempting to become more cohesive as a unit. Though the looming 200 kilometers may have made focusing difficult. On December 2nd, Gang Parade tweeted out that they'd be leaving Dogenzaka at 3pm the next day, and that their account would be tweeting out the livestream links of each member as they tagged out. Saki was the only one that wouldn't really be livestreaming their point of view, since she'd be running the full 200 kilometers. Suffice to say that the home stretch would not be entertaining to watch. Also in the same tweet, the Ekiden was referred to as the Death Parade. A fitting name is, I don't know, someone might die. So the marathon kicked off around 2pm the next day, and a ton of playboys turned out to support Saki, with some following her in cars, on bikes, and even on foot the absolute mad lads. Even though Saki herself wouldn't be streaming her progress, there'd be a camera on her at all times, as the marathon was carried out by two teams, Kamiya Saki and a rotating camera person, and a rotating runner and camera person representing Gang Parade. This was to ensure that progress was always being made, and to allow each team to take a break every so often. And thankfully, their management came prepared for those much-needed breaks, as it appears that vans awaited each group at the checkpoints, carrying supplies and giving them a chance to rest. The sun went in quite early, but it didn't set on the spirits of the runners, all of whom seemed to keep a positive attitude, probably trying to make light of this ridiculous feat. A lot of their energy had to have come from the insane fan support, as their dedicated fans stuck by them both physically, with some bringing the members food, and online, submitting fan art throughout the first day. 60 kilometers in at about 12.30am on December 4th, Saki sent out her first tweet since the marathon start, thanking fans for their support and promising to do her best. And a few hours later, at about 2.30 a.m., she'd hit another checkpoint, take a very short break, and set off once more, looking ragged as the mileage started to set in. Saki's team would continue running until the sun started to rise, at which point they'd crash in the van for a quick power nap, with runner Yuka and camera person Miki taking over for Team Gang Parade. However, at about the same time, Yua pointed out that neither team had reached Itami by 6am, meaning that they were behind schedule. With Team Gang Parade now in the lead, Team Saki would quickly try to get back on track shortly after 6, as she and camera person Doxin began to run their final 25 kilometers to Itami. Even throughout the night and the sunrise, the Playboys were in tow, enduring this hell with Gang Parade, and encouraging them on social media, even running through a disaster drill. No natural disaster could be worse than Gang Parade failing to reach their goal on time. Anyways, by about 8.30am, Team Gang Parade had already entered Atami, with 4 kilometers left until the midway point, and Team Saki was still lagging behind, with 15 kilometers remaining. About an hour later, Team Gang Parade reached the Atami goal, and Team Saki still had 10 kilometers to go. Koko and Yua took advantage of Saki's slowing pace to take a quick break, before heading back to Dogenzaka at 10.30, even passing them on their way out. About 40 minutes later, Team Saki finally reached the midway point, where Watanabe was waiting for them. Now, at this point, there was... No way either team was finishing the 200 kilometers on time. As mentioned earlier, the initial 100 kilometers would take about 23 hours to complete, and both teams didn't really outperform that time. 
arriving in Atami in 20 and 21 hours, respectively. Putting it plainly, completing the Ekiden within two days was impossible for a number of reasons. They were idols, not trained runners. They hadn't prepped for this challenge in really any way. Everyone was low on sleep, hungry, etc. And fans knew this, with some questioning the stunt's possibility. Despite this, Saki still took to Twitter, apologizing to her supporters and the Playboys for being unable to complete the marathon within the allotted time. She explained that she felt regret because she believed that she could do the impossible, but blamed her slow pace for falling short. She certainly wouldn't be able to make the journey back on time, if at all. So Watanabe called an audible. It was announced that the group would complete the 100 kilometers back as one team, and thankfully, Coco and Yua's progress back had already counted towards this unified journey. Fans were completely understanding about this, as the group asked for their continued support following the rule change, with everyone just wanting to see Gang Parade return to Dogenzaka uninjured. After all, teamwork makes the impossible dream work. Having one team run back meant that the runners could take longer breaks, and this change seemed to revitalize the members, who looked more lively as the trek back started. That revitalization wouldn't be maintained for very long, as the sun started to go down once more, and fatigue began setting in again. But predictably, darkness and tiredness weren't enough to deter the enthusiasm of Gang Parade, who pressed onwards, smiles on their faces, and laughing it up on Twitter. They hit the halfway point around 7pm, and around 8 it started to rain. As the weather worsened and the temperature dropped, they donned rain gear and continued on, not allowing the gloomy conditions to dampen their spirits. By 1am on the 5th, they had about 23 kilometers left, and fans were taken aback by how quickly they managed to cover the distance they had. Reading the responses to the streams on Twitter shows how invested viewers and attendees had become in this with some saying the group's teamwork was inspiring, and others actually crying because they were overcoming the odds. It reads like something out of an anime, and I'm honestly surprised no one has adapted these types of stories for that medium yet. At this stage, these types of reactions were one of the only reasons Gang Parade was even still going as they neared Shibuya with only 15 kilometers remaining by 2am. Everyone was tagging out more frequently, and the distances they were running became shorter and shorter, eventually knocking another 5 kilometers out by 4am. But believe it or not, their greatest challenge still had yet to come. Around 5.30, they had about 7 kilometers left, when it was announced that all seven members would have to reach the goal together. Physically exhausted and mentally worn down, Gang Parade accepted the challenge in stride, as Saki led the charge back to Shibuya. Right when they neared the end, only three kilometers remaining, fans behind them, fatigue probably at its highest, and the desire to quit seeming more and more appealing. A familiar face came to the aid of not just Gang Parade, but their friend. That face was Mizuta Madi. I'm convinced she's Saki's guardian angel and you can't tell me otherwise. Thankfully, Madi's support provided everyone with one last burst of energy, as all seven members of Gang Parade crossed the finish line, a little before 5am on December 5th, hands locked. No one cared that they failed to complete the Ekiden within the allotted time. Everyone was just happy that they made it to the other side, mostly unscathed. Save for Yua, who sustained a knee injury in the first 100 kilometers. Even still, she stepped up, running throughout the early morning hours and whenever someone needed a break. Luckily, the 40 hours didn't seem to do any serious damage to Yua's knee 
or anyone else for that matter. And for their trouble, they were all given onions. Beats a trophy or a medal, I suppose. They wouldn't be the only ones leaving with some treats, though, as Tadashima Yuka gave Watanabe an apple. That was filled with worms. Gotta have protein in your diet, you know? Anyways, those onions must have been very potent, because Yuwa gave a tearful speech, thanking the fans for their support through what many believe to be impossible. Throughout the 40 hours of running, even when they were injured or couldn't keep up, no one ever said quit. They had each other's backs, uplifting one another and keeping spirits high when the going got tough. Because of that never say die mentality, a lot of curious viewers walked away Gang Parade fans. Not because of their music, but because the group endeared themselves to the twit casting audience through their compassion and determination. This experience seemed to bring everyone, fans and members, closer together. And for that alone, many considered the Ekiden to be a success. After the 200 kilometers, interest in the group was at a new high. They'd captured the hearts and emotions of so many across the internet with their teamwork and imperfect, clumsy nature as a unit. Reading up on the hardships they'd endured through the marathon and up to that point, it's hard not to feel some kind of affinity for them. So I'd imagine following along with their story in real time must have been magic. It also helps that they were releasing some bangers too. They give their new fans a chance to check out these tracks the very next day. As the group resumed hitting small venues, showing no signs of the marathon they were still only a few days removed from. On December 15th, the video for their first seven person single, Plastic to Mercy, was released. And it set the standard for future gang parade music videos. It's got some artistic qualities to it, along with some strange sequences reminiscent of P.O.P. And ends with the group being turned into what I presume is plastic. Even though the song was mostly unchanged, save for the vocals. Fans responded to it well, likely because it was a lot of people's first time hearing it. From there, they then focus on the single's release and the release events being held from December 26th to the 31st. This time though, the group was looking to cash in with the three new members. For each copy of Plastic 2 Mercy purchased, customers would get one Gang Parade ticket, one ticket granted entry for the handshake event, two allowed for participation in the individual member checky shoots and signings, three allowed for a checky shot with two members, four allowed for three, so on and so forth, up to eight tickets for a seven-member checky. Not too sure how successful that plan was, though I was able to find these, so it's safe to assume that it worked to some extent. Always looking to the future, on December 27th, the group announced that they'd be holding four consecutive one-man shows at Heavy 6-0, from February 12th, to the 15th, along with a female-only live show called Girl Parade before their first one man on the 12th. Though the female-only show probably seems like it's out of the blue, Gang Parade would usually do something special for female fans at lives, whether it was giving them cash back for ticket purchases, or setting up a woman-only area at the venue, which is cool to see. Tickets for these events would go on sale at 10am on December 28th, and per Yua's Twitter account, all five shows were sold out less than two hours later. Might as well give them a license to print money. 2016 was definitely their biggest year so far, with the name change, album release, graduations, debuts, cis merger, and the absolutely mammoth marathon. So it's fitting that they'd get to end it on a high, as Plastic 2 Mercy came in at number 2 on the daily Oricon chart for December 27th.
and they wouldn't slow down heading into the new year, holding their first live on New Year's Day 2017, and continuing to appear at festivals and stores through the first few weeks of the year. Gang Parade would have their name in lights again at the end of the month, with a slew of announcements. First, on January 22nd, they announced a new single set to be released on April 25th. Then, on January 26th, they announced the Body and Seven Soul Tour, a promotional tour for the single with three dates. April 9th in Osaka, April 22nd in Aichi, and April 30th in Tokyo. I know Gang Parade's had a weird things with names so far, and like the rest, this one will make sense when we get to that point. But Watanabe saved the biggest announcement for last. The WAC Joint Audition. This would be the first WAC Audition Camp, which I covered in my last video, but just in case you need a quick rundown, the WAC Audition Camp is a yearly live-streamed audition where hopeful idols are put to the test through singing, dancing, marathons, and much, much more for the chance to join one of WAC's groups. So the audition was announced on January 27th, and following two screening processes on February 15th and 28th would officially take place from March 28th to April 2nd. With a free live show on the final day, the WAC Exhibition, where every group under WAC would perform, and where the new signees would be announced. Members of each WAC group also participate in the audition, acting as mentors to assist the auditionees, and representing Gang Parade at the 2017 camp were Yumeno Yua and Tadashima Yuka. Gang Parade had a lot of exciting things ahead of them but they had to make it past their four one-mans before they could worry about their next single or any new members. Heavy 6-0 was the best venue they could have chosen for those shows, due to the intimacy that comes with the small size, but also because of the history it bears, with Saki making her Biss debut there in 2013, and Coco, Doksan, and Tarashima debuting in Sis there the year prior. And of course, Gang Parade lived up to the pressure, delivering four fantastic performances. Even though they played songs as far back as 2014, the shows were all about looking to the future. They released a new visual, and appeared in new outfits on the first day. And on the final day, Yua delivered an emotional speech, thanking the audience for their support, stated that she wanted Gang Parade to be the number one idol, and to continue moving forward with the Playboys. In between all that, they performed over 90-minute sets to a pretty well-behaved audience, only getting rowdy for Plastic 2 Mercy. It seems like the declarations were holding up pretty well, sadly. Oh, I also want to let you know that at the end of the second day, Coco snorted Udon, because if I had to see it, you do too. After these one-mans, Gang Parade would get to take a rare performance break for 9 days, before hitting the pavement once more on the 26th. Comparing their first show back to the last show before their break, it's clear that something's... different about one of the members. Not gonna say much more than that, but <laughs> it'll be obvious in a second. They'd begin gearing up for the Body and Seven Soul Tour through these lives and by releasing their next single's music video on March 10th. The track is called Foul, and while I could talk about the simple yet crisp visuals, or the tranquil electronic rhythms and drums leading into this explosion of hopeful instrumentals in the chorus, I'm gonna choose to focus on the same thing everyone else did. Saki shaving her head. It's safe to assume that the video was shot within the nine days they were away from touring, and upon their return to lives, Saki wore a wig until the video's release. I know it probably doesn't seem like a big deal, but this was huge, sparking a largely positive reaction from Gang Parade fans who dug Saki's new look. Natalie even released a two-sentence article on the video 
just to talk about Saki shaving her head. And credit to whomever made her wig. It's really difficult to tell without knowing. Also, the video revealed Body and Seven Soul to be a chant in Fowl's Bridge, hence the tour's name. They play their new song live for the first time the next day, and continue promoting the tour and Fowl's release, as Wack geared up for its first audition camp, just weeks away now. As March rolled on, the company released info about the exhibition and the audition's live stream. And while I'm sure Yua and Yuka, along with the other WAC idols, prepared as best they could for... How do you even prepare for this? I mean, tickets for the exhibition were distributed by random numbers at 10 a.m. on the day of. Not to discredit him, but did Watanabe just play these things by ear and get by with a lot of luck? The only ones who need some luck were Tadashima, Yua and everyone else participating in the WAC audition, which kicked off on March 28th. The two of them entered the camp with one goal in mind, making Bish fans, Bis fans, and new viewers, Playboys. Since it was still a new concept, the shenanigans weren't in full swing yet, but Yua and Yuka got to lead their own teams in dance rehearsals, participate in singing death matches, and run marathons. Fans got to vote for whichever team they believed performed the best in the dance rehearsals, and the rest of Gang Parade was all over Twitter, urging fans to vote for their friends, encouraging them when they placed low, and praising them when they ranked highly. On the audition's final day, Saki tweeted that she loved her friends more than she cared about Gang Parade winning votes. Aww. Yua and Yuka represented the group well in the audition, and closed out the final day with a win over Bis in the last dance rehearsal. However, throughout the audition, viewers were either saying that they hadn't heard of Gang Parade, or would comment that an auditionee who performed poorly was joining the group. Now, you can probably imagine how these comments made the members feel, but towards the end of the camp, viewers were also saying that Plastic 2 Mercy was stuck in their head. So the two of them silenced the trolls and added more playboys to their fanbase. Now everyone was preparing for the exhibition the next day. Gang Parade would open the free show with a 23 minute set, featuring a diverse track list and an impressive pace. They were the perfect act to open the live with too, as they pumped up not just the crowd, but also the audition finalists, who were reportedly dancing to Plastic 2 Mercy off to the side. Not even technical difficulties could slow their energy, as Foul not only cut out, but resumed playing behind the performance, from which Micah and everyone else recovered flawlessly. At the end of the show, the eight audition finalists would join Watanabe and the WAC groups on stage to learn their fates. Bis would get two new members, whereas Bish and Gang Parade would remain unchanged. Or so it seemed. Right after revealing the Bis editions, Watanabe pulled a fast one and announced that Saki would be traded to Bis in exchange for Aya 8 Prince joining Gang Parade. The news caught both groups, as well as Aya and Saki, by surprise, with both of them and a few of their groupmates crying. Miki took it especially hard, and understandably so, considering Saki was the sole reason she was even on stage. Gang Parade had been through so much in the year they were operating under that name alone, so, losing someone was probably the equivalent of a family member moving across the world to them. Plus, it was Saki, their leader, the one who'd been there since day one and someone they all admired. I don't mean to knock Aya, but for Saki, someone who'd built a notorious reputation for themselves and is beloved by just about everyone, to be traded for someone who hadn't even been an idol for a full year yet, probably felt like a gut punch to the other six members too. I mean, I cannot stress just how upset Gang Parade was by this announcement. 
Saki kept her head up, even though you can clearly see her feelings on her face. But Gang Parade didn't even try to mask their emotions, just letting the tears flow. Following a few more announcements, Aya and Saki both gave short speeches, likely asking fans to continue supporting their respective groups, and promising to work their hardest as members of their new groups. Finally, the new BIS members got to say a few words, and the WAC exhibition came to an end, leaving Gang Parade confused, saddened, and surrounded by doubt. Nobody knew the reasons behind the trade, or what to even expect out of it. At first, calling it scary would be an understatement. Gang Parade were losing the only guidance they had through this bonkers journey. The next most tenured members were Yua and Miki, both of whom had only been idols for less than two years. To the other six members, they probably thought this trade was the prelude to a death knell. Everyone had a choice, step up or shut up. And seeing how this is Gang Parade, I'm sure you can guess which option they chose. They'd charge into this new chapter headfirst, Aya ate Prince at their side, and there's no way any of them could have predicted what was to come. A surge in popularity, a string of hits, larger sold out venues, and the opportunity for everyone to discover themselves as performers. This trade would not only help Gang Parade climb the mountain, but go beyond, and really take themselves higher. No one could have predicted everything that would follow Aya's addition, and while the immediate results were good, the long-term effects this trade would have on the group would be irreparable. <laughs>